Hey guys, and welcome back to the Two Cents Podcast, powered by Meaningful Minute. This is Yossi Ben Shushan, and in this episode, Ari and I are actually going to be interviewing each other. We're going to be discussing the differences to what we do, to how we work with people. Um, we're going to be discussing Mishpach articles. We're going to be dis- discussing uh, working with drug addicts versus working in Kirov, speaking, obviously, <laughs> and many other good co- topics. I mean, we have a whole list. But um, I don't know how far we got into it. You guys will see. This episode is brought to you as Chus Zivug of Avram Yaakov Ben Fagel Razel. And a very, very special thank you to our sponsors, Yad Lachem, who are helping rescue Jewish women and children. You guys have heard it from us so many times already, and I will scream it from a mountaintop. But I don't have a mountaintop. I have a podcast. Where's Ari to laugh when I need him? Anyway... I would scream it from a mountaintop. Yad Lachem is out there doing a modern day pigeon shvil and saving lives every single day. They have countless of cases open to save lives. You guys can help out. Get out there. Let's get another family saved on this episode. Yadlachem.com or saveaworld.org. Saveaworld.org is the specific website Yad Lachem has set up just for the Two Cent Podcast listeners. We're able to track and we know who you are out there. So saveaworld.org. Go out there and donate, donate, donate. Save a life, modern day pigeon shvuyen of this awesome work that Yad Lachem is doing. Saveaworld.org or 718-633-2340. Enjoy the episode, guys. Hi, everybody. This is Ari Ben Shushan. And this is Yassi Ben Shushan. And this is the Two Cents Podcast. Brought to you and powered by Meaningful Minute. Hey, everybody. Okay, another Two Cents. Welcome back. Podcast. Welcome back. Well, the welcome back. Okay, you should say welcome. Baruch haba b'shem Hashem. Baruch haba. Back. I, I, and, we're doing a little earlier, a little earlier in the week this week. So it's like, uh, it's such a treat yeah. that we get to do this twice in such a short amount of time, I think. Yeah, so it's fun, you know. By the way, yes, I, I'm I'm having a good time with I'm this. I'm having a good time if, with this. If, if I'm being brutal, <laughs> um, if if we have to be honest, um, you know, Baruch Hashem, this is fun. What what with technology and all, yeah, I feel bad for you because I I get to I get to after this I get to go home. Like you just started your day, like you just started yeah, your day with I this. You're started. gonna be drained. I'm drained after these. They're so yeah, see, I have so many things. I have so many things, Baruch Hashem, after this. And, you know, each time we have to, uh, you uh, counseling me as well. You know, today I, I have a few people after this as far as uh, counseling or meeting goes. And, uh, you know, this is actually something interesting to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? Let's just jump in. Yes. All right. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Let me, a- let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. <laughs> let me ask you this. No. Yeah, by the way, no. No. No, we shouldn't no. do that. We shouldn't even even no. make fun of that. That it's was just from many years ago. I would just like to clarify. The childhood that is many years rears ago. Rears its ugly head. Well, if anybody knew even what we were talking about, they would know we're talking early nineties. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to be clear. Yeah, see, it's like I just want to be clear that like it was many years, years ago because that wasn't a very um, appropriate. <laughs> okay, appropriate. Okay, so uh, we're just gonna jump back into right. appropriate, Vel. Uh, oh, next right. Don't miss the turn. There's appropriate, Vel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. Um, yes. So uh, let's talk about this because um, counseling is an interesting thing. We've both been doing counseling for uh, a pretty long time without realizing we were counseling people. Right. <laughs> right. Like, I, don't, I don't know about you, but, right. you know, with the guys in yeshiva and even before right. that, informal. it was just sitting down with somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I guess informal counseling. And so... Now, Baruch Hashem, you, you, you are well-known, you know, you're out there. Um, yes, I was in Florida recently, and this has been happening to me a lot. Um, I, was, I was in a restaurant, and there were all these guys over there. And you know, they were like whispering and asking. So my wife and I, like, they were doing the yeshiva guy thing. Yeah. Um, they all ordered one thing of French fries for six guys. You know, I, I felt bad. They didn't have, you know, they, they paid like $12 on spirit to get down there for yeah. like an off Shabbos. Um, to get French and, fries. Uh, then, 
right, to, to, you know, because they, they, they were. And so my wife and I ordered a dessert and it, it was delicious, but there was a lot of it. And I didn't want to, so I offered it over to the guys and I, I'm like, guys here, do you want some churros? They were amazing churros. You know what I'm saying? They were like pillows of happiness. So I offered them. I was like, do you want our churros? And one of the guys was like, I'd rather get a share from you, which was very, very sweet, right? Yeah, oh, good line back, you know? Oh, you're right. Uh, Chushan. Uh, and one of them said to me, all right, I'm just gonna have to ask you. Are you the risk factor guy or not? Because it's just <laughs> killing you. You know, it, it's like I'm trying to picture you with. I'm trying to picture you with that. You know, this happens a lot. Down south hat. You know that. Yeah. And, and so, and so I'm like, so the guy's like, well, what's the difference? You know, like, what do you guys do? So I said, well, Yossi really knows how to counsel people, and and he really saves people's lives, um, helping them with their inhibitions, etc. So Yoss, how long does it take for you to feel like you momish counseled someone? Let's say somebody's on the drugs mm, mm. let's say somebody's doing yeah those are drugs <laughs> somebody's doing the drugs <laughs> when when would you say okay okay marty you're better you could go out into the world and you can use scissors again right like like, like when when does that happen right, so that that is probably the most dangerous question to answer ever <laughs> um but let, let me preempt first of all i remember one time I, we got confused for each other all the time that that that's a given um even by our own kids that has happened. Um, oh, do you remember? Yeah. Say the story. No, you go ahead. You can go ahead with that one. You know, I'm gonna when I pass it what? back to you. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give you that story because go I wanna go ahead. But okay. but like funny things happen. <laughs> my my kids, Mora. She claims because I know, I know she's a, she's a big fan of both. So she claims she did it on purpose. But I saw I saw the look. It wasn't on purpose. I don't feel no offense, Mora, but. They made this like collage of the family and all different pictures and everything. So we had to send in the pictures and the Moras would cut out everything. So some of the picture ha- pictures, I guess, had both of us in it or maybe my wife and your wife and you were in it or whatever it was. <laughs> and it wasn't once. There was a good three or four pictures of you on, oh, on his collage. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know we were doing extended family here. And, wow. and they were like, oh, oh, no, we thought it funny because it's only you. It's not like they put Avi also. <laughs> it was like just you. They didn't even, I don't even think they put grandparents. It was just so it was like you and you're you're like you're making a funny face. And then Ashi's making a funny face back at you like in like two of these like, you know, and cut and paste. Thing, and I'm like, things. what is he doing with my child? <laughs> um, but the weird the, the wow. so it happens all the time. But the 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 best one. The cancer thing is always uh, is always because I feel bad telling people no. <laughs> people come up to me right. and like I have something to share with you. In my, you're the one who was sick, right? I'm like, no, oh, no, I wasn't. They're like, oh, <laughs> I have nothing to talk to you about. <laughs> I have nothing to talk to you about. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sorry. It sounded like it was gonna be good. I I'm, I apologize. Oh. But the one that was this took the cake. This one was great. I I went somewhere to speak. It was in. It was in one of these like training sort of things. It was a um, let's say a cure of training. I'm not gonna say what it, exactly what it was, but it was like let's say it was like a cure of training type of thing. And they wanted me to speak to to the people there. So these are all like young guys, but like are going into cure of and everything. And I spoke, and I was saying you don't have to be. Um, I think it was like you don't have to be the coolest guy in the room. You don't have to be the you know. I was giving a whole. Uh, sure, this guy comes up to me afterwards. I forgot what his exact complaint was, but he was upset. And he was like, it's funny, yeah, it's funny, yeah, that you mentioned that now, right, all Kiev people are English, that's it, even if they were born in Minnesota, the they become English after they start doing Kiev. So he's like, he's like, it's funny you're saying that now, because I was at a Shabbaton with you, and he starts going into all these complaints he had about, now this guy, by the way, would have had complaints about a stick on that Shabbaton, like he was not happy <laughs> about anything at all, ever. So he starts yelling at me. I'm listening to him, and he's going on. He's like, and before you answer, and he kept saying that. That was like his tagline. Before you answer, and he kept going. Like, there's a crowd starting to form around us, and he's yelling at me. He's like, before you answer, and he keeps going. And then finally, like, he's done. And I knew, by the way, the first second he started this eight-minute rant, what happened? I knew immediately. And I was like, <laughs> I, I'm Yossi Ben Shushan. He's like, yeah, I know. I'm like, nope. No, you're talking about Ari Van Chushan you because you're talking about the story that he did with the Rebbe in what do you call it? That's Ari's story. That's not mine. That that's that's my brother. 
and you never seen a person's face fall. It was like taking candy from a baby. It was so sad to watch because wow. he, sad. you could tell he was holding this one in for a while, yeah, and yes, he really for years. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he and really wanted he to give it. He worked up enough courage. But there he is worked a, up enough courage, and but there's also times. Yeah, he. I mean, be honest. Where it's just it's one of those days, and it's a rough one, and I'm like, yep. They're like, you're Ari Ben Shushan. I'm like, yeah. You just accept it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's me. Oh, oh, yeah, hundred yep, uh, percent. Yeah, sometimes people come up to you like, "Are you the writer?" Uh, I, I do write. I do write <laughs> <laughs> mostly in my own journals. <laughs> the, Does um, it make a difference <laughs> where the writings are? So, okay, so but to get to the question, I'm sorry. So, yeah, see, enough, enough bouncing around the question. Yeah, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, so let's the, do this. You're okay, trying so to avoid. It's a really dangerous question because there, there is no real answer there. Um, it, it, it's also Agreed. very controversial, especially in my line of work, especially in the particulars of my line of work. So if I'm working with somebody who is working on a Mida, right? Let's take a diction out of it for a second because addiction-wise, there is zero way to answer that question. It's an impossible question to answer, especially um, without starting fights with those that want to say addiction for life and, and addict for life and everything, which I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're wrong. It's just it's a debatable topic. I'm not saying which side of it I'm on publicly just yet because – you know, I'll 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 stay on my side for right now. It's not it's not a cowardice thing. It's just it, it, it's an unnecessary fight no, to have. You no keep your yeah, cards. Yeah, no one's going to agree with anyone. Keep your cards close so enough. Taking, and that's it. Yeah, taking addiction off of the table when you're dealing with a uh, a thing. So I always start with people once we pinpoint, which doesn't always happen right away. But once we pinpoint a specific meet or a specific uh, uh, time or way that they would that that they're uncomfortable with themselves, which is a very big Robert Berkowitz thing. Also, you know, start working on yourself with the things that you hate. Start working on yourself with the things that 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 dis, that that really just irks you about your behavior, and and build from there. So once we start that, I always say to them right away, more or less the second we pinpoint it right away, I say to them, "What is your life going to look like without this? How are we going to know when we're making headway?" And let's say it's a married person, I'll be like, "Well, my wife would definitely." you know, be able to notice, um, you know, my boss would be able to know this person, that person, or my parents would be able to notice or, and immediately. Now I think it's so important because you can, not, you can, you have to work on yourself for forever. If you go to a person or if you yourself are working on yourself, there's always the, and then, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. See, so, yeah, no. So I don't have that anymore. But, but, but now like you can always jump to something else. You know, if you never recognize the growth, the growth that you have, if you never recognize the step that you took, you're never gonna get any seatbook from working on yourself. It's never gonna happen. So I think it's super important for people to do that. And that's how I know is that I'll always be able, I'll write it down and I'll always be able to pull it back in a month, two months. I'll always be like, how is your wife or how is how are your parents viewing you now? Has this gotten better? Has this gotten better? And they'll always like a crazy percentage of time always lean back and always be like oh yeah actually we haven't fought about that in a really long time we haven't that hasn't why do you think that is i'm like why do you think that is <laughs> it's because you worked hard because you yeah. got past it right because you got that so yes i i i think a clear aspect of the question is and and i this isn't a complaint i get from a lot of people um i used to get it from parents in arts as well and here now i hear it a lot certain people feel that therapists are in it for the long haul, meaning that they're excited to keep a patient for years. You know, hey, it's great. It's steady income. You meet once a week, once a month, you know, whatever the regimen is. And that the therapist is like, oh, there's more and there's more. And I guess from the patient, let's call them that perspective, um, this is a never ending kind of a regimen. So right. when somebody comes to you, Yas, are you looking to like, hold on to them for a long time or the moment they get to you, you're already thinking or you tell the guy uh, or person who you're helping, um, look, we're going to try to do this in as little sessions as possible to get you uh, as quick as we can go. If it needs more, it needs more. But are you looking at it from a perspective of I want to help this person, get them to where they have to be and then move on to the next? Or are you looking like I'm taking this question. person in for like a lifelong journey? Yeah, it's a great question. That's a great question because it really, we could dispel a whole bunch of things right now with that question. That's a great question to be asking because it really, me also, yeah, I, I get that all the time. You know, therapists trying to, you know, what, it's not really an applicable example, but I just always loved this idea because people are so certain. You know, the, the cabs in Israel, everyone's like, oh, he's taking you for a ride. He's taking you for a ride around so that the Monet keeps going up and up and up and up. And then finally, I was talking to a cab driver. Who, 
you remember that guy who used to live in my building on Peron 4? He was a cab driver, whatever. See, he, he was telling me, he's like, you do realize that's not how it works, right? So I was like, you know, what are you talking about? He's like, the way we make money, I mean, the, the money maker part is getting a new person into the cab, not keeping someone in there. Because every time, just for opening my door and sitting down, I get my 12 shekel. After that, I'm making a little bit, but it's not as much as I could just drop that person off as quickly as possible and grab a new person. Now I'm up 24. I'll make it. It doesn't. It doesn't equal. So I was like, really? So everyone's That's walking around with this crazy idea of. He's like, yeah. He's like, they're all wrong and it's insane. So I'm sure there's people out there yelling right now. No, I calculated. Maybe you're right. Maybe not. My point is, is that don't jump for those types of things right away. Let me explain how how therapy happens. Now I don't do therapy. I'm not a therapist. I, I'm here more for counseling, call it, you know, clergy counseling, rabbinic counseling, whatever you want to call it, life counseling, I don't know, but I'm not a therapist. So with therapists, the way it works, with therapy in general, and if you're working with people, you'll know this, right? You have a Talmud, right? No one's going to complain about a Rebbe holding onto a Talmud. Why? Because no one's paying for it. It's free. So no one's going to, also because a Rebbe should be there the rest of his life. Yeah, I, I get the difference. I, I, it's not being lost. I mean, my, my point is when someone comes to therapy, they usually come in saying they want to work on one thing. They have it very specific, very clear. I want to work on one thing, right? Someone, and especially to me, someone will walk in and be like, um, I, uh, I, I'm addicted to gambling. I just want to, I just want to take care of that. I'm like, okay, so, you know, what's going on? No, 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 no. Don't want to talk about anything else. Let's just talk about the gambling. I'm like, yeah, that's not how that works. There's a reason you're gambling. And without taking care, in the, uh, uh, taking care of that compulsivity, without taking care of the reasons behind it, without taking care of the triggers, without taking care of all these concepts, false notions, all these concepts, you're not going to get anywhere. You're never going to be able to get rid of it. So once you start opening... Yeah, 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 yes, I, I think a good muscle for that. If somebody showed up to a skin doctor and had like a discoloration... And he just says to the skin doctor, could you just give me a cream for this? Right. And the skin doctor realizes that skin cancer and we have to go, we just have to go much deeper. Yeah. And the guy's like, just, just give me a cream and let me go. And the answer is we can't, right. you know? So that's a hundred percent. So now, so now with these guys, so with, with people in general, they come in. Now let's say you go to a therapist and you've had this anger issue your entire life. This tremendous anger issue, and, and, and it just it takes you over. It ruins your relationships. It ruins your friends. It's, it's taking over your life, and you finally had enough, and you go to a therapist. And it takes a month, two months, three months, four months, whatever it takes, but your anger is gone. You don't even recognize yourself. You, you, you look around at your life, and you're like, like, I got a new lease on life. It's amazing. Your anger's never gone, but it's under control, let's say, and, and you feel amazing. What's your next response? Take care. I'll see you later. That's what you would say then? No. You would be like, wait a second. I have another thing that, that it wasn't as important as my anger. My anger was destroying my life. But I also have this low self-esteem issue that like I get I get uh, I feel very uh, uh, unconfident in a lot of areas. And this, uh, you wouldn't bring that up for someone who was able to take care of that massive issue. Of course you will. So it tends to start to happen that you work through one issue and you want to work through more and it's working in your life and your life is getting better. So people now the, those, that guy, by the way, is not saying I've been in therapy forever and he's not complaining about it either. It's everyone else that yep. sees him is saying, the I, this guy's is. been in therapy for three years, four years, five years. I don't know what to do about it. Whose choice is it to keep him in therapy? I've never known a therapist. There are bad therapists out there. I want to clearly say that. There are some horrific therapists yeah, out yes, there. The really, really, not only bad therapists, but they can also be bad people, okay? They're out there. This is why you get a reference and you usually go through an organization that knows their stuff about these people and everything. It's not an excuse not to go to therapy. It's not. It's just not an excuse not to go to therapy. You'll be able to tell a twisted therapist or a bad therapist or someone who's just inept at what they do. You'll be able to tell within the first couple of sessions that they're just not good at it. So now that that person is never the person that's complaining though it's not the guy that's in there as a matter of fact i've known so many therapists to try to end it try to be like listen you work through your thing you know especially if they're if they've just came to a point where they're raising their prices per hour and they feel bad raising this guy because he's been paying that for however long so they're like listen you know i think you're good to go i think you know oh that's worked out and he's like well what? we have all these other things that i want to work on that's not on the therapist I don't know. I don't know any therapist. I've never worked with a therapist that tries to hold on to people. As a matter of fact, nowadays in my life, I believe one okay. of the most complaints. Yes, it's really good you're saying this. 
I really, I, 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 the most complaints I get from people are therapists actually dropping them when they felt it was too early. This is one of the most complaints I'm starting to get nowadays is therapists wow. dropping people when it's too early because there's one very big, and, and you're going to, you're going to like this. There's one very big key point here that no one is really paying attention to. A therapist shows up every single day and sits down. He became this for a reason. He is trying to help. He is trying. Yes, he's getting paid per hour. You're right. You're right. Because he's also trying to make a parnasa. He's also good at what he does and he should get paid. So he's coming. He's trying to make a difference. If he hit a brick wall with someone and all they're doing is sitting there and talking and talking and talking and nothing is changing, he's getting no seatbook out of what he's doing. He is going to lose his mind. No one tries to do that. No one. No one does that to themselves. Nobody. There is no reason, there's no logical reason anyone could come up with for a therapist to sit there in session meaninglessly. There is no logical reason. Oh, because they're getting paid so much. Yes, maybe they are getting paid a lot. Some of them, yes. Some of them, no, by the way. They have plenty to pay for also. Maybe, some of them are, some of them aren't. Yes, but I, but I, even if wait, you wait, are paying this, someone I'm, hundreds of dollars an hour, it is very difficult to sit in a room and do nothing for that time, even if you are getting paid well to do it. You will lose your mind. There's no logical yes, reason to accuse the, them of the, it. Yeah, uh, I, I know. So you're right. Logically, there isn't. But I think on this point, um, I'm going to have to disagree and just say that we, we've we both seen people who stick around in something, um, although they're burnt out from it, but they have to because they have rent to pay. Right. We've seen Rebeam past their prime. And one would say, well, you think he became a Rebbe just because of his paycheck? No, he did it because he loves kids. He, he did do it initially because he loves to teach. Um, but But eventually, certain things... Life sometimes, you know, uh, you get, so it could it could happen to therapists as well. So I agree that therapists certainly start out with that passion, and whether or not they continued with it, I think is something that a person has to see. Right, but like, but on that point though, on that point though, you're going under the assumption that he doesn't have another client. If he gets rid of this person, he could get someone interesting in there that he could work uh, with. That's interesting. The Rebbe, uh -huh. he's just burned uh, so, out so from that, the job. The Rebbe only he's has not one burned class. out from the client. Ah, uh, every therapist feels that there's good. another that's there's another point. client that they could get to another now. person. I hear that. I, I, I hear that. Yes, that's a very good difference. Okay. Yes, so let's keep on going with this. Um, um, uh, yeah, let's shift gears. When it comes to writing for, for, for Mishpacha, yes. Um, you see, you see I, I, I guess this thought comes from the place of, you know, the jobs that we do and, and um, how we go about it. Maybe a creative process. I'm not sure. But um, Baruch Hashem, you've been writing out for, for Mishpacha for two years, I think. It's little almost two years. Less, no, I less. A little, a little bit less. Oh, almost, almost two years. years. I, I, yeah. A little bit less. Oh, I I, and Baruch Hashem, big hit. A lot of people loving it. Um, I, I, th I think from what I see, Mishpacha is either too afraid or you don't let them put the, the, uh, the letters to the editor to you inside their letters to the editor because I, 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 don't, know. I don't know if they're too colorful or not. <laughs> you know, but the, the, the reason why I brought that up, yes, is because like a lot of times you want to hear from people's feedback and letters for the editor do get there. Um, but you know, I, yes, yeah, so let me start it out this way. I, I just wanted to go speak in, in a school over here. Um, last week, they asked me to come and speak. And one of the teachers asked me, um, is that your brother who writes for Mishpacha? And I said, yeah, they said, wow, you know, I got to tell you something. Yeah. I write, meaning the teacher said that they write, um, something for a shul, like a bulletin, like once a week. Um, you know, something nice for the shul, the Vartor, whatever. He said, and you know, it takes me a very long time and I feel a pressure. He said, I can't even imagine the pressure that your brother has because he has to have stories. He has to come up with things that are really, really just incredible. Um, and to do it week in, week out is something he's like, I don't know how your brother is just a normal person. So I said, well, that's a very far assumption you just made. <laughs> Said I'm not sure. I said, I'm not sure if assuming that is really in your yeah. best interest. Uh, but Lamaisa, take us through the process. Yes. Like, when is your like aha moment? Like, yes, I right. got it. Like, you know, so, like that's going to work. So that's, that's, a, that's a rough one. It, not, not a rough question. That's, a, that's, that aha moment is, is, a, is a rough one. So I got called from a shbach. I never wrote before and I, I never wrote anything. I got a call from a shbach and the, uh, the editor over there, um, Friedman. She called me and she asked me, uh, "Do you think do you think you would uh, you'd be interested in trying to write something?" And 
it, it, there's an amazing story behind this whole thing, but we don't, we don't have time for that now. But um, so I was like, yeah, you know, let, let me let me see what I could do. She was like, what would you? And, you know, we, we batted around a bunch of different ideas, what, what I'd be writing and everything. And and the stories of what's going on, I felt was the you know, we, we love using stories to educate. And the main point was not to just write stories. I, I didn't care. The main point, although you know, we have that side to us, that, that creative side that wants to, and I love creating and, and it's beautiful, but uh, but time wise and everything, it just wasn't, you know. So I, I wanted stories that was gonna that, that that was gonna you know affect change, that was gonna allow people to learn a lesson from it or, or be able to take from other people's experiences and everything. So I um so I started writing and Baruch Hashem they had this uh, unbelievable writer, uh, Mrs. Reicher, Ms. Zivia Reicher who's an incredibly talented writer and she she's able to take the rantings of a madman and somehow you have to see what I send them it is a mess it is such a mess and then she sends it back to me and I'm like well, <laughs> well. this is not bad good job big guy and and I'm I'm also very impressed with it but you know, it, there's a there's a whole team of people that go into that. But um, but so when writing them, it's it's really it's the story itself is not difficult. Believe it or not, it's the lying that's hard. So what I mean by that is is that I can't I can't tell anyone the stories. I can't. One of the best parts of this whole thing is that I finally get to share the stories because I'm never allowed to say any of these things. And so usually, what what the stories are is a compilation of about two stories I, I usually try not to have more than two stories running at one time in one story and i cut and paste two stories together so i'll have the background of one story if there's like a funny background to it or a funny situation to it or you know an interesting situation to whatever i'll have that running with the dialogue and situational uh, part from a different story running in the middle of it so none of them are really recognizable to the people that were involved but the the way the story happens the process I used in the story, the conversation of the story, for the most part, uh, unless I get carried away with either dialogue or jokes, which obviously I will say is definitely embellished, <laughs> and and so on and so forth, is uh, is is all accurate. They're they're all accurate and on and on point. So for me, the aha moment, it's not that difficult. I'm in the middle of doing something with someone. I'm like, this is gonna be a great article one day, and <laughs> I schedule it for like eight months later, and then I'm good to go. There so go. in the beginning, it was very easy. I had spot. I had all these things from the back that were able to come up, and then you know other things that for me the hardest part about the writing part or getting that aha moment is that, and this this is what you know. You know, and this is also one of the problems, I guess, with the inbox uh, thing is that they do. We do get a lot of inbox. We do get a lot of things sent. I um, I, I, I don't get to them quick enough. So just to get the article out is very, very hard for me. I, I you know, writing is not my strong suit. And it's it's just it's very, very, very difficult for me to do. I guess I should stop telling myself those things because maybe it'll become easier then. But I I. So I'm always f four or five days after deadline. I'm, I'm way too after deadline. It's not right. There are people in Israel that got to stay up all night that like it's, you know, the risk factor article and whatever Trump said that morning are like the two things on their desk to last minute work on to get stuck in. And they finally said like a few of them had said to me, they're like, you do realize the people working on your articles are 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 like kept as emergency people for last minute updated, like what do you call it? Ever since you started writing, all of a sudden these guys have way too much work to do because I always I'm always that late after deadline. I feel really bad about it, but you know, in it, Dr. Lieberman said to me that I'm lying about this, so maybe I'm lying. I don't know, but in the process, like that pressure actually is what gets it out from me. Like if I have to write it, if I have to have it done by Thursday, there's no way I'm I'm really I have the story in my head, but there's no way I'm sitting down to do it before Wednesday. And and then to get it out and and everything. So I told Dr. Lieberman, I feel like I I jump off of that pressure. And he's like, No, you don't. He's like, You're telling yourself a story. He's like, You're lying. No, you don't. He's like, You could do the same thing a week. Really? Earlier. Because I feel the same thing. I feel the same thing in my life. Yeah, yeah. That 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 for a speech coming up or whatever, I can sit down a week earlier, put down ideas, write it down, and then the night before the speech, I sit down and look at the notes. I'm like, Nope. No. Me too. You know, it's, it's not. Me too. And but Dr. Yeah, Lieberman and, said and no. Then, 
Dr. Not only that, you want to hear something interesting? Dr. Yes, Lieberman? If Dr. Dave said no, no he's right. He is of right, course. and we are wrong. Of course. You want to hear something interesting? When I was talking to him, I asked him, I was like, what do you prefer, speaking or writing? He's like, oh, there. <laughs> he's like, come on. Come on. I'm like, right? He's like, come on. There's no question writing. I'm like, right. Wait, what? <laughs> no. What? <laughs> what? Are you? <laughs> what do you say? He's like, writing, for sure. He's like, there's a process. And he was talking about it like it was a symphony. He's like, it's so beautiful. And I'm like, oh my yeah, gosh, no, gosh, no, that's not how it is good. for me at all. <laughs> so well, you need a lot of discipline. You know, Baruch Hashem, he's a very disciplined yet. Yeah, yeah. So in writing, in writing for me, that's the aha. We're going to get right back into our episode. But now we want to talk about our incredible sponsor doing the most incredible work possible, Yad La'achem. You know, Yad's... Something that I've been thinking about is is that whether people are going to be hearing this episode the day it came out, or whether they're going to be hearing it in a few years from now, but this message is going to, unfortunately, still remain as active and as urgent, and people need to be as aggressive with their help as ever. You know, yes, if... Yad La'achim should ever have to close down because there's no more women or their children in Arab villages need saving. We'll make an entire episode with with the Chuck Norrises, with all of the ones, all the black ops who went in there. But see, but we can't, yes, we can't talk to them yet because they're still involved. We'll do a whole episode once. We'll taunts. We'll be thrilled when Yad La'achim doesn't need any more money. But until then, we need our sponsors. I don't know. Yes, what do you think? Right. Yeah, on this one, you know, it's interesting. On this one of interviewing each other, Ari and I grew up obsessed with superheroes, and here they are. I mean, these are them in the flesh. This is unbelievable what's going on over here. And like, you know, like you just said, I, I, I really think that's important. Whether you're listening to this now or you're listening to this 10 years from now, it's still important. It's still, there's a saving going on right now by Yad Lachem. No matter when you're listening to this, they have a case right now that they're working on. They're either about to go in, they're inside, or they just left in our village. So get on there. The website is saveworld.org. The phone number is 718 633 Two three four zero. This is so important. When we were speaking to Rev Nasanal, he said at any given time they're running on eight different cases. They have fifteen hundred a year. There are twenty five thousand Jewish women living in right now. That's with their kids living right now in Arab villages. I mean, just imagine these children. You know, after one hundred and twenty, you come up, and these kids are standing over there saying, "This person." pulled me out of becoming an Arab and made and me And the a grandkids. Again. I mean, that's it's right. amazing. Le, oh, may odd. Okay, so again, we're going to please ask our listeners to go to Save a World, S-A-V-E-A-W-O-R-L-D, saveaworld.org, or call 718-633-2340 to go and give Yad La'achem that ability to continue their incredible work. And now, yes, getting right back into our interviewing each other episode. A story hit me in the brain Go. that I could care less about your aha right. moment now. That was it. It just hit me. I was sitting in a Pesach program with Dr. Lieberman and everybody else, including this guy, we were fressing and, and eating. Dr. Lieberman sat down with a salad. <laughs> He's so you know? cool. And, I, and I'm not sure because his me this like he felt like salad are people. And so therefore he went over to the salad bar, which was forlorn. <laughs> Nobody was around there. And he said, it's okay, salad. I appreciate you. And he took some of it just to prove it. Or he's just so in control, Blian Hara, that he was happy to sit down with a healthy alternative it's, to the racks of lamb that were hanging from every other part of the hotel. You know, this was the hotel yesterday. I went to sleep at night, and they took this from the Godfather. I would just take away the, the blanket, and there was a side of ribs inside. <laughs> like, oh my, they put food everywhere. And, and he was very happy to just say, so you have to be somebody, I feel, who's like so in control. Um, with and and so in touch with his understanding that he understand his writing process, whereas we like to just like express on the uh, right. turn of a dime, you know, right. a knee jerk reaction of expression um, that comes out. And so therefore, we feel that having that impetus of the night before right. is going to really pressure us. Also, into yeah, some a lot of our of, yeah, a lot of our stuff also comes you know from a very emotional place, comes from a very you know. So it yeah, it definitely does. You know, yes. Uh, Oh, a lot of times when I'm flying to go give a speech, um, I I will wait. I mean, like I'll write up some of the speech beforehand, but I will wait to um, sit on the plane, start to miss my kids, 
Right, right. Yeah, and I then, do the same thing. <laughs> and listen, and listen. Yeah, oh, really? And listen to sad music, and begin to actually cry. Just get emotional, and then just hear that voice of raw, do your guy. You know, just something going, and then start to write. I from speak. There. I speak so much better when my family's not with me. Only because of the missing them part of it. Like I, I come up with so much better stories and stuff like that because there's a certain emotional part of them not being with you. But but let me put it back on you though. What like so for your in my opinion and 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 I do believe you're deaf and it's not my opinion by the way at all. This is what everyone who stops me in Lakewood, you know, and New York wants me to know as a as a criteria to speaking to me. They come up and they're usually like, you do know your brother's better speaking than you. I'm saying like that's a um, that's just the way that is. Okay. So yeah, I, I and I, I no 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 okay. no. I truly do. I truly do believe that fully. So, but I want to know because you have you 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 are more you and um our brother Duvi. You guys are you guys are much more polished at speaking. I feel like there's there's a um a different persona. I mean, aside from the fact, I mean, let's start in the beginning over here. Stuttering to speaking, right? Ah. That's that had yeah. that had to be like because you started when you were young, very young speaking the stutter all oh, the speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, young, let's think. Yeah, I, I guess. Um, I, well, I mean, you know, there was always stage uh, stuff in in camp, but stuttering to speaking. So. It was something that I always felt like I wanted to express uh, myself and um, the stutter just stopped. I mean, uh, we find Yassi. Uh, <laughs> they are great people. Love. They are great people. I love that uh, one in. I just want you to know this. You literally, Yassi, you literally, you not only threw it slow, but you figured out where the slow motion button is on planet Earth, and you press that too to make sure it comes as easy as possible over the plate. I could have <laughs> walked away, had an espresso, come back, and the ball will still be flying over the plate. I can then point to the center field wall like Babe Ruth and then take to swing when, thank you for having lobbed that when, so easily over when in the you, middle of the when plate. you started talking about camp i was like what is he doing he is going off script <laughs> <laughs> there is one very key answer here <laughs> yes yeah i was just i was just spitting into my hand toy toy with the camp to be able to get to the point <laughs> now let's let's include our dear audience yeah. um in one the world it is that we're talking about so um uh, there is a there's a yid. He's not Jewish. His name is uh, his, his name is Bruce Willis, or maybe Sir Bruce Willis Yossi. And nobody knows. Maybe he's been knighted. And uh, he's somebody who had a heavy stutter growing up. And he found out that when he would get up in front of an audience uh, in high school, he would be able to all of a sudden perform, and the stutter was gone. Sir Winston Churchill, um, who is a sir, uh, one of the greatest orators. Um, that we have seen in our generation was somebody who also had a speech impediment. And when he would stand up in front of um, the audiences, in front of everything else, he would give some of the most incredible speeches ever. So I don't know what the psychology is behind it. Again, Dr. David Lieberman would be the guy for us. You see, people don't know, but and poor Dr. Dave, he should start to charge us. Like whenever we need to know something real quick, I always just message him. <laughs> Me too. I'm like, Dr. Dave, um, <laughs> stuttering <laughs> to people than not stuttering when I, <laughs> me too and for I, I never I never write full <laughs> sentences either by the way I do I, little I, bullet I, I point words quick... and then he sends me back a thing <laughs> I don't him... even say thank you and he sent and you see he sends it back so nicely dear sir you know Colin <laughs> it's so sweet um so whatever that condition is to be able to do but I really accredit it Tasha uh, certainly you know at least for me uh, there's a concept. There's a story with the Lubavitcher Rebbe that I, I don't know if we have time to really go through right now. Maybe maybe we'll save it for a story podcast. We'll save okay. it for a story podcast. Um, but there was a story that the Lubavitcher Rebbe helped me, actually. Um, and uh, did you say Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson, Ari? Did you say that you're... You, you and Rabbi Y.Y. We're both just hanging out with, with Lubavitcher Rebbe. Maybe. I can't remember everything of my childhood. <laughs> no, no, no. But... Um, I definitely credit to Hashem. Uh, it happens wait, to be Ari, these weeks now we're going wait, through. Wait, yeah. wait, wait. You, you, have to, you have to give a, give a shout, shout out over here to how, how you did get to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Just that. 100%. So we have the best uncle. Um, 
He cared for us like nobody's business. And he was really there to always make sure that right. our needs were met and we came first. Like, yes, he was momish. Yeah. Like, he's, 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 he's an uncle. He's an he's like an older, he's an uncle Abby. Uncle Abby Goldgram um, is somebody who uh, very many times throughout our growing up uh, that he came as a key player to help us in very many things. Yeah, yeah. And I just um, to mention, Uncle Abby, I just I'm going to say this story. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say the story. Bezal Hashem, we're going to have a stories podcast, and I would like to right. include yeah, that yeah. over there. But thank you, Yossi. Yeah, very necessary shout out. Absolutely. Um, a point here is, though, is that, you know, certainly I say the, these weeks' parishes, that Moshe Rabbeinu says, Aval Nier al time, you know, I, I, I have a speech impediment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. How embarrassing is that? But then I feel like the Maestro Bane <laughs> stood up and he knocked it out of the park. <laughs> You're right. You're right. You are Maestro Bane. I feel like Bainu. you got to buy this. <laughs> No, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that Moshe Rabbeinu, if they asked him for an aliyah, I'm sure they're like, yeah, mud. He's like, because when I get an aliyah, when I get an aliyah, yeah, see, when they call to this day, people stand around and they wait for it. And they're just like, let's hear the yeah, mud. I'm like, I can't get through my own name. Also because you have about eight names. Moshe Rabbeinu. That's also true. Um, adding on the Yechiel in the beginning, I thought maybe that would help me. Wow, that completely took out any chance ever. But I don't even say all my names, Yasi. I'm just like, I, I just try to get... And, um, and Abba's name, you know, Yasi, I have been the son of many people by Elias. <laughs> just whichever name is... The- <laughs> whichever name is the easiest. Yeah, I'm like, ah, uh, 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 Ben Menachem. That's it. I'm just picking Menachem today. It's just easier than Yitzchak. I, I, I just, so I'm sure Moshe Rabbeinu got Elias and they were like, yeah, Moshe. He's like, you know who I am. Like, let's hear it. <laughs> m- m- uh, you know, but when it came from Moshe Rabbeinu to give the Aserah Sedibras all day, he knocked it out of the park all day. Um, and and I, I, I know this sounds crazy to everybody. Um, as these podcasts continue, the craziness, you know, starts to really show, rear its ugly head. But the point is, is that, um, I never <clears throat> really forget, and every time I get an aliyah and I get embarrassed from it, I say to myself, Baruch Hashem, thank you for the bushes, so that I remember that the koyach of giving right. over, the koyach of speaking, is something that mamish Hashem, Hashem svatai teftachu piageti latecha, right. Hashem literally opens up my lips and gives me words, because um, if not, right. then it would just be an impossibility. Right, um, I think... Uh, uh, as far as... Yeah, yeah go, no, go ahead, yeah. I say, as far as polished, I don't know. Duvi, Rabbi Duvi, he's very polished. You know, very, very polished. Like, wow. Um, you see, I think before you start to jump into it, you know, I was watching Duvi a lot, you know, like to see Duvi's ins and outs and Duvi's way of going about it. And so, therefore, I was certainly imitating uh, a lot of, of Duvi. Um, and just altogether, we both know that once you have a, a Mahalachim telling a story, which again, we'll have a story podcast about that, but there is a certain um, stop go with it. And there's so much, so much Siata Dishmaya uh, that goes into when you stand up in front of the audience. And just, you know, this feeling, you stand up in front of the audience. Yeah, I said it, I had a Shabbaton this past week in, in Florida. And um, as you get to know the community over the week, uh, over the Shabbos rather, when it gets to Sudash Lishit, when you get to your last speech, you know, to the community, I said to them, I generally prepare something completely different than what's on my paper from, uh, because I, I just get the vibe, I get the feeling. Yeah. And so I said to them, if I'm ever in a community and you see me pull out my paper and read from it by Sudash Lishit, then you know that you have absolutely yeah. no personality in this community. <laughs> but you know but but if i'm changing stuff around it's because so you feel a vibe and duvi told me i think one of the most important things about speaking he said ari if you give a great speech don't take credit for it and you give a bad speech don't beat yourself up about it right. and the reason why he said is because hashem decides that the people in the crowd they need to hear something it's their schuss, it's their merit and so if you give over a great speech, it's because they had the schuss to hear it, and Hashem chose you as the idiot to give it over. Right. But if they don't have the schuss to hear it, you can be the greatest orator in the world. Hashem is not going to give you the words, and therefore, 
just don't beat yourself up. I think I'm more like Bilam, unfortunately, than Moshe Rabbeinu then, you know, like <laughs> basically it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's just what Hashem puts into your mouth. And we have seen the Siyata Deshmaya from speaking. So people ask from preparing speeches, of course you have to put in your Hishnadlas. Of course right. you have to know how to look up stories. You, you have to know how to be able to polish it off and really think, really think about what you go first, second, third inside it. Uh, the possibility of surprise um, inside the speech. Again, right. Well, we're going to get to that. Certain certain I, wanted, I wanted to ask you about that also. Well, first of all, Aral okay. Safasayim, right? We yeah. have to do this. You're not going to say Aral Safasayim without this. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, yes. Go ahead. No. You can do it. Far stop the word, Far stop the lippin. There's no, it's there one of go. the best Yiddish teaches on earth. Aside from maybe Saviv, Arum Geringelt. So yes, yes, I just spoke um, a few weeks ago by a Hasidish uh, like company. They asked me to come and speak, and I stood up and I said, "I want to let you all know something." The word "savim," <laughs> I said, "the word arum geringelt." That's not normal. You all <laughs> think, and I asked him, "What's what's a touch?" And they was like, arum geringelt. I said, "Okay, in this room, I'm the weird one, but you should know, <laughs> in the world, you're the odd one out." A rumgeringelt, that's not a normal thing. Yes, the guy who came up with a rumgeringelt, he was probably sitting there thinking, all right, what, what do we have on the list today to translate into Yiddish? Ooh, Savid. Yeah. Oh, what do we do? What it's do one we... of those days. A I... rumgeringelt. He came, yes, he took off the rest of the day. <laughs> he was so proud of himself. That was amazing. So yeah, uh, so, uh, you're right. How, how could I have tiptoed past the Ralsva time to, uh, yeah, without how, saying fresh up the yeah. lippin? That's what I was thinking. Um, okay. Yep. So, <clears throat> but just in general, there's a lot of people out there. Now, it seems when we started, um, you started a little before me, but when we started, you know, uh, there weren't as many, you know, I mean, and, and yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of this has to do thanks to the platforms and whatnot, but there weren't as many speakers, definitely not, not as many influencers in that way that were out there. It was a, it was a niche market. It was like, a, it, it wasn't that many people, you know. Probably one of the greatest moments I ever had is when, and by the way, the only reason I had this and you didn't, and I felt so good about it. The reason I had this and you did is because you live in LA. That's it. That, this was the whole difference. After we did that uh, all day thing for Torah Anytime, that might say Shabbos, right after Shabbos, I got a call from Pesach Krohn. And he was like, no, I thought, stand up, <laughs> stand up. I thought you wow. and your brother were amazing. And I was like, my, my wife was driving wow. the car, and I told her to pull over, and she thought we were coming out of Mommy and Abba's driveway. She's like, what happened? What happened? What happened? Like, is Abba okay? Is Abba? I'm like, Pesach Krohn is on the phone. <laughs> Just hang on a second. And, you know, because uh, so in the Pesach Krohn days, in the way to go, there was no one else. I'm like, who, who else was, was speaking? Who else was the – so, you know, and, and in Duvi's time, right by Duvi's times and everything, you know, nowadays there, there, there are so many people out there, and it became a um, – an idea that people really want to, for better or for worse, I don't know. But it became an idea that people really want to get into, really want to know about. So I always think to myself, like, because people ask me this, like, and I, I really want, was curious what your answer would be. Like, if you were going to tell them, like, one thing that you wish you knew about speaking beforehand, what would it be? Wow. Right. Good question, yes. Right. Wow. Right. It's a big one. You know what? You know what? Say five things. I have, I have an answer. I mean, the second answer I'm going to give will be more obvious, but the first answer is not so obvious. We, I don't know about you, but I'm sure you'll agree with me. I think the greatest speakers that have ever been have been stand-up comedians. Um, I think that they have a koyach in because nobody can hold an audience inside the palm of their hands like a stand-up comedian can. Right. Um, yes, you know when you're sitting in an audience and even a regular speaker, he says a joke and everybody starts laughing. There's somebody next to you. What did he just say? What was so funny? What did he just say? And you're like, oh, yeah. you want me to say over? The joke? Yeah, yeah, it's very often. But but how come stand-up comics have everybody? And and yes, I mama sat down and I wanted to, this is a sugya. This is really a talent to learn up. And mm-hmm. I realized the stand-up comedian talks to the people or with the people Whereas a speaker talks at the people. A speaker yeah. stands up very and he side. says words into the ear and he hopes that the words float down into people's minds. Rabbi Isai, today we're going to see such a beautiful medrash 
and 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 I don't know why. I'm not sure when that sing song, when that trup of speaking became a thing. It's when I think they started out in Birche. There was once a man who had, you know, like, like, like just da 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 pa 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 pa. You know, uh, that's something where people are told right away, you are about to hear a speech, go to sleep. Right. Right. Whereas you and I, and I think Reb Dovi and, and many others as well, we speak right to the people as if we were speaking just to one person. Just, hey, what's every, a lot of times I'll just start off a speech just laughing at the audience. And, right. and just so, like, I don't so, know. Rabbi yeah. Dovi is the master at warming up a crowd, I found. Because he starts talking yep. to one guy. He always does this. He'll get up there, look around, he'll do the thing, and then it's like, solely. And then he like he'll say a joke to him, whatever. And like everyone's like, it becomes a conversation. It becomes very interactive in that. Where everybody right. Where everybody wants to get in. <clears throat> so the idea is the idea is having a conversation with the audience that they feel they conversed back to you without them saying a word. It's Right. That it's it's really something to figure That's, out. Like that is, that sometimes is, you talk powerful. for them. Sometimes you talk <laughs> for them. You know, you'll say something. Let's say giving a tefillah class, and you have to say, like, guys, I get it. I'm not going to be saying any stories about tefillah because let's face it, the story always happens to the other person that they davened Hashem, and all of a sudden the train grew wings and flew out to wherever. But for you, you never get answered, and so that frustrates. You know, you just had them tell you. Don't tell me a regular tefillah thing because we've heard those already. Tell me what I'm thinking and put out the fire in my own heart of the frustrations that I have with it. It's talking to the audience, with the audience, not at the audience. So I think that understanding that mahalach, because what a stand-up comic really does is he speaks of frustrations. Hey, hey, anybody ever go to the airport recently? How crazy is that? Right? Now, people right. love jokes, but also he's talking about a situational thing that everybody it's goes relatable. through all the time. And so people automatically relate that that's what they now have as well. So now that's uh, the first thing I want to tell somebody to really learn how to, there's one very famous speaker out there that you and I both know that we're very good friends and he started out his speaking more like a camp counselor of like, nah, 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 nah. and I said to him, mm-hmm. stop, stop, just stop that right now and start talking more situational, more comedian-esque and um, Baruch Hashem, you know, he became very, very well. Okay, yes, one and two is the other thing is you're going to mess up in your speeches. And oh, yeah. people, a lot of them, are just going to, oh, my gosh. So, yes, um, we're almost at the end. I want to finish off with one funny story, a bad story about a speech where I tanked. Okay, wait, I, I wanted, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that. Worst, worst speak story. Worst, worst okay. story of speaking. Worst speech. Worst speech. Okay. I have you uh, beat. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right I now, I have you, you for beat. sure have me beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you sure have me, me beat, but although I do have terrible ones, but you know when you get one story that pops into your brain, so you can only just think of that one. I know yours. So, so th- I'm gonna guess yours. Which right one now. was it? San Diego. Yeah, San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> How well do I know my brother? <laughs> you're gonna. I'm sorry for everyone out there. Wow. You're gonna see why that was such an amazing call. If he gives you all wow. the information, you will see why that was such an amazing, well, no, amazing yes. call. Hold on. You want me to talk about when the electricity went out in the house also? Like no, the no, whole no, no, thing no, 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 no. Go for it. But, but I, just all I need is for you to say how old you are. That's it. Okay. I was I was 18. Right. I think, okay. So it, uh, my point is right. is that it's not like it was in your career and it was this big wedding. No. At the time, was, it seemed like this the end was of the, the world, I'm sure. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, this was the beginning. <clears throat> in Camp Romamu, I got up to give like a quick Dvar Torah once on Shabbos, and there was so no Torah in that Dvar Torah, and it was just a story. Uh, because I was, I was nothing years old, right? I was like 18, and one of the people who worked there happened to have lived in San Diego, and they said, we have an organization in San Diego, um, teenagers, the like, we would love to fly you in. And I said, what? She said, fly me in? This is like 1997. Y'all see, airplanes were only invented two, three years before that. <laughs> so I was, you know... <laughs> Yes, see, in order to get a ticket, you you needed to go to like an office and chum chum. You had to get a, a, a whole a whole book with like an emblem on it. You know, it, it, this this was really something. So I remember I even went and and and, and I bought a suit for it. And um, I remember Avi drove me to the airport. We didn't have brakes in the car. It was uh, Zadie Avashalom's old car. We got to the airport, and, and I got there, and I'm just like, wow. I had like five stopovers. It was the worst <laughs> flight ever. Finally, I get there, and, and I'm ready. Yeah, I prepared, and I, and I had such good stuff. 
I show up and was a Shabbaton with a lot of teenaged um, boys, girls. Uh, we went off to someplace in the mountains over there and I got up to give the speech Friday night and everybody's feeling good and everybody's, and the worst part was there was another guy that they flew in as well. And this guy was really fun and really cool and really exciting. And like he spoke before me and everyone just loved it. And everyone was like, great. And, and, and I was like, wow, you know, the guy did really well. Um, and I'm like, you know, good. You know, he, he warmed up the crowd for me. <laughs> Stupid. And then I stand up and I'm like, hey, everybody. So my name is Ari Matusha. I'm from New York. <laughs> Flew in on a plane. Nothing else. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, so what do you think about those chips that they give on the plane, eh? You know, I, I'm, I'm just trying to, nothing is working. I'm saying nothing's happening. I'm like, wow, I can use a coffee right now. And everybody starts laughing their heads off. Oh, no. I'm like, what? Oh, no. and, and they're like, yeah, hey, Rabbi, just, just say that again. I'm like, what? Say it again. Uh, I flew here from New York. No, past that. I'm tired. I can use a coffee. Ah! They all start laughing. I'm like, what is so funny? They said, it's not coffee. It's coffee. Oh. It's coffee. You said coffee. And they all started laughing. And that was the only laugh I got. The rest, and the poor person who brought me in was just like, oh, what a waste of humanity. All the money on that ticket we had to save up for years beforehand to send this idiot to fly here and nobody spoke to me. Yeah, see, I got done and like, are, like, are you finished? Like, are we supposed to clap now? And I just sat down and, 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 and nobody came over to say good speech. I was supposed to speak by Sudash Lishi, but I didn't. They didn't, they didn't, they, they conveniently forgot to, to have me. Uh, and, and, and I was there till Sunday afternoon, you know, oh, wow. It was just, it was an absolute train wreck. Yep. As promised, I have you beat. You ready for, Go my, for it. This is, this is a bad, this is really bad. Partially your fault, I think, but it's still really, really bad. So here we go. So they asked me to speak at the Hanukkah, whatever they call it. I don't, they don't call it Hanukkah Masiba because we're not eight, but... The Hanukkah something, Hanukkah get together, which Berkowitz. is a big deal by Rabbi Berkowitz's uh, call out. Ah. Okay, so I'm older already. I'm not. I'm not a speaker. Yeah, I'm not out in anything. <clears throat> I'm still in the call out, which made it worse. And I'm. Uh, it was one of my first years there. And the guy that asked me to speak comes up to me and he says, "Your brother Ari did it last year, and he killed. He did Aye. so well." And you want to know why? I said, why? And he said, the worst thing you could ever say to me. He said, because he was so funny. (laughs) No. (laughs) So all that means to me is you got to bring the funny. Don't repair anything else but the funny. And I go in and first of all, worst speaking situation First of all, you're in a room of speakers. You're in front of your Rebbe, not only your Rebbe, Rabbi Berkowitz and everyone. And I decided for some reason at the last second not to use a microphone in a room that had a mechitza with an equal <laughs> amount of women on the other side that couldn't see that I was speaking. <laughs> so their side never got quiet. And I get up and I'm nervous as oh, anything. And I say my first joke and nothing happens i open with a joke and nothing happens and i go to a second joke and nothing happens i turn around and even remember berkowitz was like i wish i was somewhere else and i'm looking (laughs) around and then the worst thing happened to me i got someone comes up to me and hands me a paper and it says on it please stop and sit down no (laughs) No, yes, no. <laughs> Come on. I promise you. And that was the Whoa. worst speech ever because the next day I had to still show up to Yeshiva. <laughs> show up there. That's right. And walk through wow. all of these people that were there. It wasn't like a simcha no one's ever going to see me at again. I had another three years left. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. And so the reason I love talking about this is because I honestly, at that moment, I was like, what am I thinking? I can't speak. So 
in the uh, in the everlasting infamous words of Doyle Brunson. Good. I can't for the life. He was a poker player. I can't for the life of me remember how I built my bankroll, but I can remember with vivid clarity every single time I lost it. So I honestly, if you were to ask me what my best speech ever was, I don't know. The most honored one I ever gave was probably at Mama's Lavaya because that was just luck. None of you guys were in the country, and I got to speak by Mama's yeah. Lavaya. That was amazing. But I other remember. than that, my grandmother. Uh, other than that, I, I can never tell you, like, what a great – I don't know. I don't know. But this speech will never, ever leave me, and I always call on it whenever I need to remember that, no, you don't got this. You just get yourself ready. Right. Get yourself, but people edge. need to know this because you're going to get up. You're going to mess up so many times times your jokes are going to fall flat they're going to laugh at you no one's going to like it and you're going to make up stories in your head Rabbi Berkowitz does not remember that speech for anything I swear to you no one in that room probably remembers that speech but to me it's all anyone can think about from that room every time they see me when you're like they're, they, they, they regretted flying me in these are the things that we're going to tell ourselves these are the things that because I can almost guarantee you the speech Ari gave over there Rabbi Ari gave over there was probably actually pretty good it was just not on his he didn't he didn't expect to wow he didn't he wanted to wow and the, you got to be ready to fall to fail to get embarrassed to you you eventually get that feeling for it and 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 you go for it that's it all right yes yeah um we are we are out of time over here uh, this has again been the two cents episode podcast wow two cents podcast episode um we don't I, know. Just, episode, episode what? yeah I, I have you been counting this is <laughs> I, I, let's just say this is four and move on from the, yeah, this is four. Um, and thank you very much uh, to Meaningful Minute, powered, powered by powered. Meaningful Minute. And yes, we will see you guys next time. Take care. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Two Cents Podcast. I sure did. If you did enjoy it, please leave a comment, leave a review, whether you're listening on Apple, Spotify, watching on YouTube, or listening on the Meaningful Minute app, leave us a review. And of course, if you don't yet have the Meaningful Minute app, that's the place where you'll listen to this podcast earlier than everywhere else. That's the place where you'll see exclusive content from your favorite rabbis, your favorite speakers. Please go ahead and download that app. It's free. And leave a review. Let us know what you think. Stay tuned for more episodes, guys.